Well, it's a pleasure to be here today. Um, the topic of this conversation will be the benefits of a nutritional supplement lipoflavonoid in patients with tinnitus, following on to the last excellent presentation also about um, the issue of tinnitus in patients. The objectives of this study was to really find out um, this nutritional supplement lipoflavonoid has been around for decades and otolaryngologists recommend the product. It's a nutritional supplement, as most of you know, um, but we were trying to collect data on how it reduces severity of symptoms, does it improve symptoms, and how satisfied are patients with the product. We also wanted to try to find out the likelihood of success, um, you know, to see if we could figure out what kinds of patients are more likely to respond to this nutritional supplement than those that are not. Um, so what we did from January 2017 to 2018 is we, we contacted 504 ENT physicians um, from six different states across the US representing different geographies. And what we did is we provided a free 500 caplet or 500 um, tablet sample of lipoflavonoid. And those doctors could then give that free product um, to three patients of their choice who were experience, experiencing tinnitus. Um, when physicians gave out the card to each patient, they completed a survey that really shared a little bit for us about the patient's demographics and their baseline symptoms. Um, in total, we sent 719 patients this sample. So physicians gave out the free sample to over 700 patients. Um, what we asked them to do was a lot. We asked them to complete five surveys over a 10 week period. And we got those responses from 51 patients. We did get baseline surveys from a number of other patients, but they completed no follow-on surveys. So getting the baseline information on patients was not useful to us. So we discarded and did not include those baseline characteristics in our results. Only the 51 patients who completed the five surveys. Um, just a, a note, we tried to do this the year prior using an electronic system where patients would input their symptoms and baseline characteristics electronically, and we were not successful in getting patients to do that. So it was interesting that the hard copy surveys were more successful than the electronic version, and we're not sure exactly why that was. Um, the patients who did complete all five surveys, because that was a lot to ask of them, they were given a $100 gift card from a um, chain of coffee suppliers in the U.S., and we did do a statistical analysis on the reduction of symptom severity over the 12, over the uh, 10 week period. Now, this is what the prescribers had to complete as they gave the free product to patients. We wanted to collect the doctor's perspective on what the patient's symptoms were and then why they were giving out the supplement to the patient. And not surprisingly, they had had positive clinical experience with the product. They had seen some efficacy. They knew it was supported by clinical data and that it was importantly safe. Um, then uh, this just shows why they um, gave the supplement to the patients. And again, not surprisingly, some of them gave it because we were doing this trial program as well. Then we asked the patients for some information. This was the baseline survey. So we wanted some basic information on gender, age, ethnicity, um, you know, their status of hearing, their baseline symptoms, how bothersome was the tinnitus when it was the worst? And were they compliant? Um, you know, have they ever taken the product before? So we wanted some baseline information. And then the surveys one to four after the baseline, they completed every two weeks. We wanted to, again, capture how bothersome their symptoms were um, when they were most bothersome. 
And then we also asked about dizziness. We asked about improvement in their symptoms because we were really trying to track it over time to see if they achieve benefit over the 10 week period. And then we checked their compliance. You know, were you taking the product? Because part of the, what we were trying to find out because the regimen was two caplets three times a day, we wanted to find out if they were really taking it as directed because our concern was if they were you know, non-compliant, we would not expect to have a result or have a chance at a result. And then we asked them about changes in any of their other medications, just to collect that information to be sure there were no other confounding factors that we could find out about. Overall, we had 51 patients, as I, as I mentioned, complete the full program and all the surveys. And just to note, um, we had a, a range of patients' ages, as you could see, um, you know, mostly 51 and up, but we did have some younger patients. And we had a nice mix of female and male patients, about 39% women and 61% male. What we found in the end, though, was that age and sex did not correlate to those who had improvement in symptoms. Unfortunately, it would have been really nice if we found something that we could have predicted who would respond. We did not find that. Um, we also collected the time of day patients experienced those symptoms. Um, and as you could see, most of them um, experienced symptoms when it was quiet, early morning or late evening. Some had constant and some had daytime. And again, time of day was in the end not correlated with who responded, um, who, who reported reduction in symptoms. Um, so we also wanted to know the severity when it was most bothersome at baseline. And these patients were fairly severe. 64% of them rated their um, the severity of their tinnitus being eight to 10 on a scale of one to 10. There were some who were not severe and some who were moderately severe, which is not surprising because we were asking them to do a lot by filling out these surveys every two weeks. So these were really motivated patients who had severe symptoms. And now the important part, how did the severity of the ringing or the noises in their ears when it was most bothersome change over time? And we saw at the baseline, as we saw before, they rated on a scale of one to 10, their severity being a 7.8. By the end of the survey five, after 10 weeks, their severity was reported when it was most bothersome at being a 5.3, which was a 32% reduction, which was a statistically significant result. Their compliance with lipoflavonoid, these patients were highly motivated. On a scale of one to 10, they rated their compliance very high and not surprising. Um, and we asked about their overall satisfaction. So it was nice that they had the severity reduction, but we wanted to see how pleased they were if they believed that this was the reason the severity um, was changing. And their overall satisfaction on a scale of one to 10, 33% of them said they were extremely satisfied. The biggest group rated four to seven on a scale were somewhat satisfied with the product and 18% were not satisfied at all. So overall, 82% of these difficult to treat patients were satisfied at some level with the nutritional supplement lipoflavonoid. Um, we also tried to confirm those satisfaction results by asking, what is your interest in continuing um, this supplement over time after, after this study is completed. And 67% said they would continue on with the product. 26% were unsure, they didn't know. And 7% said, no, they would not continue um, the nutritional supplement. So they were not helped. Um, so the implications for practice, this bioflavonoid complex is known to be a very safe nutritional supplement. However, we've now in this large patient experience study um, shown that there is patient benefit and satisfaction of patients because these data were very limited up until now. Um, in 2014, the AAO guidelines offered 
few non-pharmacologic options for treatment of tinnitus, and there are no current pharmacologic treatments that are FDA approved, which is what really spurred us and our interest in doing this study. Um, in 2019, there was a small tinnitus guideline advisory group that did recognize bioflavonoids were commonly used supplements and that a defined trial period should be considered when trying them, which is really what we believe we've shown in our study with this small trial of patients, we were able to find out which patients did respond to treatment and which ones do not. Um, of patients who participated in this, the study, which we called the silent study, 67% reported that they would continue on, 7% would not continue, and 26% were really unsure. So these data do support, and they were statistically significant, the symptom reduction results and the patient satisfaction results. That use of this bioflavonoid complex for symptoms of tinnitus to provide a safe and potentially benefit intervention. And as we saw, we could not find any kind of baseline patient characteristics that were indicative of who would respond to treatment. Um, and that was one of the main things we were trying to find out. It would be lovely if we could know in advance who was more likely to respond, and we were unable to find that out. So we recommend future research in a controlled setting to really focus on the identification of those patients who are more likely to benefit from treatment. Thank you so much for your time. It's just been a pleasure.